are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. Welcome to Hooked on Startups. It's just an absolute pleasure. Um, anyway, that aside, the pressure. So I, I read all this stuff about your, your enormous empire that you're building. And I just looked and I just thought, I am the guy that wears the equivalent of yoga pants, which is <laughs> basically shorts that are, um, you know, they're comfortable. Any, anything from the waist up is okay, I think. I did actually wear a shirt on a podcast the other day and I did feel different but but I'm 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 just rambling on here it's just the pressure that I feel it's a bit like when you speak to someone who's a psychologist um and you know that they are interpreting every word and they're analyzing you or or if you have dinner with a doctor and the doctor's sort of looking at you, and you think, what have you spotted so do you is is that a problem that you have now with your success with get your pretty on and everything that you've done and Everywhere you go, are, are people slightly nervous um, about what they're wearing and and how they're looking? And and, and is is the first word they say to you, Alison? I'm really sorry, but I, I got dressed in the dark this morning. <laughs> it's kind of like when you go to the hairdresser. The first thing I say to her is like, "Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, my hair's a mess today." And she's like, "No, no, that's why you're here." But yes, I hear it all the time. So. You are not unique in, in feeling that way at all. But by the way, you did a great job because I love your graphic T-shirt today. I'm it's, obsessed it's, with... It's actually my favorite T-shirt. It's my Fender T-shirt. It. It's but, amazing. But I cannot play the guitar. I own about three guitars. And I've figured out that even though you buy guitars, that doesn't actually mean you can play them. Um, I, I relate. I have a baby grand in my front room and uh, I cannot play piano. No one in my house does either. But it's beautiful. It's it is, there. It is. Someday, someday. Yeah. I mean, how hard can it be? It's just playing exactly. buttons in the right order, isn't it? You know? <laughs> it is. It is. Yes, but you did a great job today. And you know what? I hear it all the time. People are always saying to me, oh, I didn't know what to wear today. I was so nervous about what I was going to wear today. And I feel the same way. I feel like this little bit of pressure, I've got to show up in, you know, I just threw this kimono on right before you and I got on our call together because I had on a basic tank top and I thought, no, that's not nice enough to wear to be on camera. So it goes both ways. For sure. I and again back to this T-shirt. This is this is a vintage T-shirt that I spent hours and hours trying to find. Um, I wish I had a kimono now. I wish I had uh, my. It would my be actually, do you know what? I'm going to buy a smoking jacket, <laughs> and I'm going to do all of my podcasts in a in a velour smoking jacket from now on. I think I would love that. That would add a lot of class. I might have sure. a sort of like a, a have a, an El Pipo in the side, and every now and then I was going to have a have a puff. Um, I think on, a, a burgundy on. smoking jacket would work well with your shirt today. I think so. Yeah. See, that's, I mean, how do you, so coming from a telecom, is it telecoms engineering background to, is this some other form of engineering? Is this material engineering? What, you know, are there commonalities? Is that, is it the, your eye, your, your engineering eye that, that, um, or did you just, I mean, tell me what, what was the gen the genesis well, another horrible word stop it i'm going to use the word passionate in a moment as well if i do use that word feel free to hang up um, <laughs> we should play a shot game right <laughs> yes yes, yes. You know, and, and anyone who says the word anti-disestablishmentarianism gets three free Ooh. shots you know yes. yeah they, um, they earned it but yeah exactly um but but so how did it start so so I read your bio and it was this sort of wonderful transition from, um, you know, engineering and telecommunications to um, the story about the yoga pants. And you woke up mm -hmm. one morning and thought, well, actually, I can't wear yoga pants anymore. And then suddenly you have a multi-million dollar business. Now, was there right. a bit in the middle there somewhere? <laughs> yes, there was a huge bit in the middle there. So I've, I've always had entrepreneurial aspirations, we'll put it that way. But I worked in telecom as an engineer for 14 years before actually entering into that. And I will say that I kind of stumbled down the path of style accidentally. It was something that I needed a solution for my day-to-day -day life. And I find that a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, start out that way and that I need this solution. It's not out there. So I'm going to create it for myself. And I will say that my engineering brain did come into play here because whenever I went to get dressed, you know, I'd fallen into this yoga pants rut. I'd been working from home for a few years 
And I couldn't quite put my finger on what had changed, but I knew that my motivation was lacking. My self-care had taken a dive and there were all of these things that were kind of snowballing into me just not taking care of myself anymore. And I felt like getting dressed was really the key to getting back on track again. But when I went into my closet, all of my clothes were from my corporate past life. And so I was defaulting to yoga pants because A, they're super comfy and B, I didn't have anything else to wear. So whenever I really sat down and thought about it, I thought I have to rebuild my closet, my closet to work for the clothes that I wear for my lifestyle now, not then. And that's when the idea for outfit formulas was really born. So I realized that there are five basic variables in an outfit formula that, that creates a complete look. And for women in particular, that is your bottom, which is going to be your pants, your skirts, your jeans. For me, I wear jeans all the time or yoga pants, uh, your tops, your toppers, which would be your jackets, cardigans, blazers, and your shoes and accessories. So I thought if I could look at my closet in a different light and view each piece in there as a value that I could plug into this formula that that would make getting dressed easier. And it did. So I started out just kind of experimenting with different outfit formulas and I would post them on my blog and other women would style these outfits and they would post pictures and they would say, Oh my gosh, this works for me. I found that your formulas work for every size, every, every shape, every budget. And that's when I realized I kind of cracked the code on getting dressed in a way because I was empowering women to be able to use the pieces that were already in their closet or filling gaps for pieces that they needed and really just take this concept and apply it to every item in their closet so that they could see that they could be paired up in multiple different ways to create mix and match outfits. And that's really how this whole thing was born. I started blogging about it and then it just kind of blew up from there. See, I'm surprised. I'm, see, I'm, sitting here thinking that they've actually got names there are classifications you've got tops bottoms you know top top, top was it toppers and, and, I, and i'm top. just thinking i have just missed out i'm just so uneducated all this sort of stuff um because i you, you know i sort of grab whatever is the least wrinkly thing um <laughs> and and hope that no one sees me <laughs> and then and then and then claim that wrinkled sort of stuff and t-shirts with holes in them are actually trendy because they're um so i you know you can bluff it but it it, it sounds like there's a science behind um what you're doing I, I say it sounds like i don't mean to be um you know so fatuous as that but clearly there is a science um there is um not just a science in terms of how you match things but um just in terms of uh, the psychology that's linked behind clothing. So what you're tapping into is something that's much deeper than just um, matching, you know, a, a pair of trousers with a, with a shirt. It's, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the, that's the, the real depth that of, of the program and the, the company that you've created. So, um, and, and I think you obviously naturally understand this um, and, using your I suppose your engineering mindset or your ability to be quite um, structured about something can can see how a could fit with b and b could fit with c but that's something that is completely beyond or, or you know I, it, it's um invisible to 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 many of us um, mm -hmm. so how, how did you sort of stumble across that and and did you realize actually there is a formula there is this um this way of, of, of creating s sort of s uh, syncrasy or a harmony between different types to deliver the outcome. And the outcome isn't actually to look good. The outcome is actually to feel good. It is. Exactly. Yeah. So I love science and studies. And, you know, whenever I started noticing that I felt like I was in a rut clothing wise and, and how that affected really every area of my life, you know, it started out with just yoga pants, but then it, it went into not wearing makeup, not fixing my hair, not working out, throwing on yoga pants. I wasn't actually doing yoga. Um, and then it snowballed into other areas of my life where I wasn't feeling as motivated at work or around the house and things were getting messy and disorganized. And I didn't have energy, you know, for date nights or for family fun. And it was really, truly kind of touching on every area of my life. And it, it seemed like such a small and simple change, but there are so many studies out there that prove that the way we dress and external changes absolutely affect us internally. And I knew that going into this. Um, so, you know, just combining that knowledge of 
getting dressed makes us feel better. Getting dressed in clothing that is, you know, a reflection of who we are or works for our lifestyle. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy outfit per se. And I think that was the first realization that I had was women were wanting outfits that made them look put together, but they didn't have to be dressed up. And when I started blogging in 2012, there weren't a lot of blogs or influencers out there that were really speaking to this particular demographic of women who are working from home or staying at home who still wanted to look put together, but didn't want to, you know, break the bank or be dressed up every day. So uh, there was a little bit of luck and timing that came into it at that point. But yeah, just really looking at the pieces in my own closet as I rebuilt my wardrobe, sharing that journey, sharing those pieces that were the cornerstones of my wardrobe with other women. And then they started coming to me and saying, hey, can you please do this for me every season? Tell me what to go out and buy or tell me what to pull out of my closet to put together outfits. And I really inadvertently created what is a capsule wardrobe. I did not know it at the time, um, but what I was doing was enabling them to mix and match all of the pieces in their wardrobe so that they could get more use out of them, get more bang for the buck, and just really be able to have a wardrobe that was functional and fashionable at the same time. And if you go back to 2012, this was well before um, any of these horrible so-called influencers um, descended onto our internet. Um, and so, um, and your, your blog became a huge success. You know, I think at one point or, you know, you were looking at 150,000 plus um, subscribers or, or people that were seeing this. So to be at the very beginning of this, I think this was probably just around the time of Facebook and social media. So this was sort of pre-social media. Um, so you probably were one of the um, most visited sites, um, I would have thought. Um, so to create that, clearly, um, you, at what point did you, did you think, hang on a second, this is, there's something here. There's something that is beyond me just um, sharing my ideas. Yeah, so it was great back in, in those days because people were coming to blogs for their communities and their communities were built in the comment section of the blog because we didn't have much social media at that point. I think Facebook was around, but, you know, this was before Instagram, Pinterest, all everything that and we're we using today. we had AOL, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. Yes. We had AOL. <laughs> yes, and for those of you who are sort of, you know, a little too young to remember, I'll put some notes in the show notes about what AOL is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. My kids probably have no idea what that is. But yes, it was it was way before all of that started. And it was harder to kind of get the word out. I mean, you can go viral so easily today. Um, well, not on Facebook and Instagram anymore, because you have to pay to play. But yes. um, there are places you can TikTok being one of them. But yes, it was a place where we were building community and women were finding me organically at that point in time, basically from word of mouth, because their friends were saying, hey, you should go follow this blog she's giving me great style advice or they were wearing outfits and their friends were saying, Hey, where did you get that? And then they would tell them about me. Um, and I also had a core group of blogging friends that I started out with at that time. And we were all kind of on the way up together. So we supported each other. We got the word out about each other. And that really sort of helped things also spread like wildfire where our communities were just sharing with one another and we were building each other up. And even though we could have been competitors in that space, we decided to be collaborators in that space and really just help each other grow and lift each other up. And at this time, were you still working from home as a as in the telecommunications field, or um, was this a, like a part time um, sort of bit of fun, as it were? Or, um, and, and was there a moment where you thought, "Hang on, this is th this is what I need to be doing, not not that." Yeah. So for six months before you know I left corporate America, I was blogging five to six days a week. So after work every day, you know, one of my guilty pleasures was I would get online, I would have my ideas all ready to go, my photos ready to go, and I would put my blog post together to post the next morning and, you know, go through all the comments and all the fun stuff. So I spent six months doing both. Then in 2013, my manager came to me, I was uh, working on landline side of telecom, which we all know is you know, a dinosaur at this point, it's kind of like AOL, right? Yeah. Uh, but I was managing networks in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And I had gone from being in a group and team lead of 20 engineers down to two. So I knew the writing was on the wall that eventually these two engineers were going to be reassigned. And my manager came to me and said, Hey, 
would you like to go learn something completely new in data or would you like to take a severance package? And I said, please severance, give me that. I will take that. Uh, so I took the severance package and it was about, it was about a six month package. And I decided at that point I was going to make it stretch for a year and really just focus on growing the blog and seeing what could happen. Because at that point I was probably already at around 50,000 page views within six months of starting blogging. So I knew the potential that was there. I just didn't know the business model or how I would make money at it. And that's really what I spent the next year figuring out how to do. And a big part of that was going to my readers and saying, Hey, what can I give you? What type of service would you be willing to pay for? Is there something, you know, that would make your life easier, that makes it easier for you to get dressed every day. And that's really, you know, gathering that feedback and having that little bit of a cushion in there to be able to try things out and beta test with my audience was key to launching a successful program when the time came for it to launch in 2014. So do you think that that process has changed with social media today? Because if you look back at the way that you created an engaged audience was by being very engaged, in other words, rather than just pushing stuff, it was a two-way discussion. So mm -hmm. you've obviously kept a close eye on what's been happening in social media because that's probably part of the lifeblood of your business as well. But do you think that's changed? And do you think, um, do you have advice for someone who's coming into um, a similar sort of world where you're, where you're offering a, um, something that's service-based? What would your advice be to try and you know, avoid the pitfalls to try and get that engagement. And, and my last point is because you talk very much um, in some, some of your other interviews about um, you know, being genuine and being vulnerable and, and, and you know, communicating. Yeah. You know, what, what is your, your real view on that? Absolutely. I believe that connection has been the key to everything in my business from day one. You know, I felt like I was making friendships with my readers, with my followers, and really just connecting with them and being vulnerable with them and saying, I don't have all the answers and it's okay. Like I can be one step ahead because that connects better with my audience than being an expert uh, because they see that I've been in their shoes, that, you know, she's been here, she understands this. It wasn't that long ago that she felt like me. So I really believe that that was part of the key to the connection was just being able to say, hey, I don't know everything, but this is what I'm learning and I'm willing to teach it to you. And being super honest about that early on in my journey. I'm not, a I'm not a traditionally trained stylist. I am an engineer. I have a psychology degree. So my background was not in style in any way, shape or form. I do have a creative side of me, which I think really lends well to this profession, but I'm just being honest with them. And my advice to anyone starting today is, you know, I hear all the time, blogging is dead, blogging is dead. Blogging is not dead. Blogging is still very much alive. I'm still getting 6 million impressions from Pinterest now. So clearly people are interested in my blog content. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's amazing for your search engine optimization. If you're putting out regular content, Google loves that. And they will show people your content. So yes, blogging is important. But if you're looking for that connection, you can certainly make it on your blog, but you can do it just as easily on a social media platform. It is about being a, being willing to show up, being imperfectly you and, you know, not having to, I always say like good is better than perfect, right? And yeah. progress over perfection. Uh, I think that that's important to just really let people know that you're right there with them. And even though, you know, you're speaking on a topic, it doesn't mean that you have to be the expert of that topic. And so many people stop themselves in their tracks of doing something because they think they have to be further along. Yes. But I can promise you that you can make that connection more authentically sometimes when you're not further along. And exactly. And I think that there's so much information that is pushed. We talked about this a bit earlier. I mean, if you look at some of the platforms like YouTube and Instagram, where it's just... Um, one-way traffic. In other words, I'm creating some content, I'm going to push it on you. I'm not going to have any dialogue or any sort of feedback. Um, and do you see that there's going to be a resurgence um, in platforms where it, there is that opportunity be, to, to have dialogue, to really connect? Um, I was talking to someone the other day who um, has you know, is, is, has, has built a, a, for decades, has run a very successful platform that enables people to deliver video messages. Because, um, again, if you're just spamming people with email, um, you, you lose that connectivity. So uh, your, your business growth 
is going to be dependent on what do you think what what do you think is the most critical thing for your you know business going forwards you know right now video is king because it is a way of connecting with people in a more personal fashion than email or written communication um, and then when you do produce video be sure to engage in your comments you know if you're doing reels on instagram or if you're posting you know on facebook or you're over on tiktok i think a lot of tiktok creators it's it's an interesting space to be in. I just recently got in there and I had a viral video, which was really a big learning experience for me. It was, it was a video, it went, I totally wasn't trying to go viral. I've been just playing around over there more just for fun, really. And um, it was really interesting to see what happened with that when it blew up and I got all of these comments that were coming in and it was just such a different audience than what I'm used to. My audience has been with me for years. They know me, they trust me, they like me, they're kind to me. But on TikTok, it is like no hold barred. They're going to say what they're going to say. And it was just a really great learning experience for me to see, you know, when you do make that personal connection with people, they're kinder to you. They feel like they know you. They say things to you that they would say to a friend, not to a stranger on the Internet. And yes. uh, that's why I think it's just super important. You know, I go through an answer, even though there were hundreds and hundreds of comments on this video, I went through and I tried to answer even the ones that were, you know, not nice because I want them to know me as a person. And I've always felt like social media should definitely be social. You, it should be a two way street. You shouldn't just be, you know, just throwing content out there and expecting to get something out of it because it doesn't work that way. It, yes. it just doesn't, you're not going to get business from doing business in that fashion. And just, just changing slightly the impact of COVID on your business, because, uh, you know, obviously apart from the, um, you know, the, sort of physical impact on, on buying habits um, more and more people are working from home um, and I think people's perception of their home as a workplace has changed significantly over the last 18 months where um, many people just don't want to go back to the work environment have you seen not so much evidence of that but what what kind of um, feedback have you seen and how how have you seen your audience change over the last 18 months in terms of what they feel about themselves and um, you know how they feel about their future and how that's changed yeah it's been really interesting to watch the progression of of things since covid uh, we were launching a huge program right before the world shut down in march of 2020 and my program sales went down by about 50 percent that first season and I was thinking, oh, gosh, what is COVID going to do to our business? And, you know, how is this going to impact everyone's afraid of spending right now or their lifestyle has changed so drastically or they're working from home for the first time. But what ended up happening was my business grew by 10 percent last year because so many more women were in the position that I was in when I first started blogging. They were finding themselves out of their routines, working from home for the first time, not sure how to navigate this new space, you know, ending up in athleisure wear most of the time. And at first it was all like sunshine and rainbows and everybody's loving it. Yay. We get to wear joggers and yoga pants and everything. But, uh, you know, toward the end of it, toward the end of 2020, more and more women were coming to me saying, I'm ready to get dressed again. Please don't put any athleisure wear on your capsules. I want to get dressed in real clothes. This is what's making me feel good. I feel like I have a sense of control over something whenever I have on an outfit that makes me feel good, even if I don't leave the house all day. So it's been really interesting just to kind of see that wave that we've been on with it. And uh, I think, you know, it's going to continue to play out through this year. I'm seeing more and more retailers, whereas last year at this time had strictly, you know, comfy clothes or were a lot of dress items there are now coming out of that too. And there are still a lot of soft fabrics and looser styles, but I'm seeing more structure and we're moving the pendulum is swinging slightly back in the other direction again. And, would you say that your focus is always going to be more in the consultancy side or do you see yourself swinging more towards, um, you know, design distribution sales? So um, is there a, an, an evolution of your business um, which is going to take on a different vertical, for example? You know, I think there is, but I'm not forcing anything. I've allowed my business so far to be really organic and follow what my audience wants, what my readers, my followers, my customers want. I have been so diligent about gathering feedback from day one and really just tailoring my programs to what's going to serve them best. I've 
consider doing box styling services, but people find outfit formulas and get your pretty on because they don't want to do a box styling service. They want control over what they're buying, how it fits, what they're spending. So I haven't really considered going into that at this point in time, but anything could change at any point in time. And I just find that it's really, you know, from a business standpoint, there's not a lot of overhead with producing a digital program, right? You know, we put everything together in a membership site and we're able to deliver it all digitally. So it's very easy um, as far as, you know, the back end of the business is concerned. I say easy, but yeah, we launch at least four times a year. We've got it down to, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine at this point nice. in time. But yeah, I don't really have plans. Maybe someday I'll do my own capsule, but I really love partnering with retailers right now and, and allowing our customers to shop at the stores that they love the most. And I guess the biggest challenge is how do you keep the uh, advice fresh? How do you avoid, um, excuse the expression, but how do you avoid believing too much of your own PR? It, you, know, not you, sure. you know what I mean? So how, how, that must be the challenge is to really uh, make sure that everything you look at, you have to try and maintain that fresh pair of eyes every time. For sure. So the great thing about my program is that it's sort of built into it. It is a seasonal based program. So every season has a new trend or a handful of new trends. So what I'm really teaching my customers to do is build a core basic wardrobe and then each season add in these fresh new pieces that you can mix and match with your core basics. So I have evergreen programs that I run year round. They're called closet staples and essentials programs. And in these programs, I really help women to build their closets up with these core staples that they can wear year after year. So these might be more of investment items that are going to stand the test of time, you know, great fitting jeans and um, good shoes and boots, outerwear, the types of things, sweaters, the types of things that they're going to be able to wear season after season that are not going to go out of style. So these are your classic items. And then with my seasonal programs, I'm able to help them add in fun new patterns and colors and trends and silhouettes and styles that they can put into their wardrobe where they're not having to reinvent it each season, yes. but it's still keeping things fresh and new. And they keep coming back. We have an 85% customer retention rate, which is amazing in the membership site space because they want this fresh new content and they want somebody to guide their decision-making with the trends because it can be overwhelming or maybe you don't feel like a trendy person per se and you're just not sure, is this going to work for me? I'd like to see this on other women. So they get into our community groups and they see all the pictures that the women have posted in there and say, okay, I see someone who is, you know, my age or my size or whatever, and she's wearing this trend. So I'm going to rock this trend too. So there's a little bit of that, you know, peer support that's going on in there as well. And that's really just what keeps them coming back for more. And it's, it's amazing. And yes. we've had season over season growth since 2014. So uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to slow down, honestly. It is, and it is all about the education, isn't it? Because it's like the whole empowerment thing. You know, it's like if you, you know, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you, you know, feed him for life. So it's that, that, that same approach where, um, you know, I guess you're showing people what they've actually really got in their wardrobe and how to um, convert that into feeling good i think i think ultimately that's that's the objective isn't it is to get people to feel good about themselves so i can imagine the the positive feedback you must get um you know must be really encouraging and um, must you know really make it worthwhile oh 100 percent. i i always tell people i self style but it's the trojan horse <laughs> The Trojan horse is style and, and, you know, they're really, they're getting confidence. That's what they're getting. So, uh, you know, I have had so many women come to me and say, this has impacted my life in such significant ways. I never thought that feeling good in my clothes could have such a huge impact and watching the transformation, not only in their confidence levels, when they're posting their selfies over the years, I can see these, this transformation happening where they're just so much more confident in their, in their clothing and really just discovering what works best for them. But it also translates into other areas. You know, we've had women tell me they've decided to go back to college and finish a degree or change a career or that their relationships have improved or that, you know, this has made their lives so much easier in one area that they were able to go explore something in this other area. So it's funny to see how this, what seems like such a simple external change, all of the ripple effects that it has on the people around them and also seeing how they're impacting other family members. You know, they'll have sisters or 
friends or, you know, their daughters, if they have adult daughters that will join the program as well. And just kind of seeing the ways that they're impacting other people. Uh, we had a group of moms join us one year because one of the moms was showing up to her mom's group dressed in these cute outfits. And every day they say, why are you so dressed up? And I think in a sense, it was kind of making the other moms feel bad about themselves because they weren't dressed up. So instead of her dressing down to match them, she said, come with me. I want to show you this. I want you to feel good in your clothes too. And as women, sometimes it's hard for us to do that. Just they want to be okay with standing out and then inviting them along for the journey. So we had this whole group of 12 moms and they were dressing in like the same cute outfits every single day. And it was just, so amazing to see how just this one mom's influence went and spread throughout her community to all the other moms and they all just came along for the ride. And again, the, the critical thing I think that this demonstrates is the importance, um, and if we, we're talking now about you know the business and the entrepreneurial side and creating a successful business, a hugely successful business, which is what you've done. Um, now, at the surface, you've got what you're doing which is the um the, the, you know the science the the engineering the the advice i, I mean I'm, I'm calling it all the wrong words and then someone looking at this very simply could say um they might be tempted just to try and create another range of clothing as you say one of these sort of you know box delivery services there is such a chasm between what you're doing and yet another box of clothes that turns up on a, on a you know the beginning of the month um, and I think what this really underlines is the importance of solving a problem not just being a me too business hoping mm-hmm. that you can ride on the coattails of of you know so, some other business that has been quite successful for sure and I think that that's been a blessing and a curse if I'm being honest uh, what I'm doing in the personal style space is somewhat disruptive no one's doing this no one's showing women, empowering them and and teaching them how to shop for themselves and showing them how to shop with a purpose and taking a shopping list into the stores. Everyone else is pushing consumerism and buying more. And I'm teaching women how to curate their closets and love the pieces that are in there and practice. Like if it's not a heck yes, it's a no. Um, And it's just completely different. And and I feel in in a sense that I'm an anti-influencer because when I first started out, I had a blogger come to me and say, you know, you're never going to make it in this, right? And I said, well, why not? And she said, because you're not trying to sell clothes constantly. And that is the influencer business model. You've got to sell other people's clothing and earn the commission from it. That's how everybody does this game. And I thought, well, that's not authentic to me. I don't shop all the time. Why would I do that? I'm not going to be somebody that I'm not with my audience. So it took me about a year to figure that out where, you know, I realized that women were following me because I was showing them how to use pieces they already had. I wasn't pushing things constantly or showing my Amazon hauls or having them go out and shop constantly. And so, you know, it's been a little bit harder because on the front end of marketing, we have to educate people expect the box to be sent to them when they hear about my service. They're like, Oh, so you're like, you're like Stitch Fix or you're like a box styling service. I say, no, I'm not. I can, I work well with those brands. If you want to get boxes delivered to you, you can use those clothes in my program, but that's not how we work. So it's been a bit of a, a marketing mystery to figure out, and I've got a great team on it, um, but we're still trying to get that education piece out there because it's something so different than anything that's out there in the space right now. And it's been incredibly successful just through, you know, what we've done organically so far. We've not done a lot of paid marketing. I've not done a lot of ads simply because I can't wrap my brain around what that looks like but um but it's a fun mystery to, it's a fun problem to solve for well, sure you've, you've you've tapped into or you've created the greatest form of advertising which is personal recommendation and that's yeah that virality is something um that, that that grows far faster and has much more longevity i think um and also from a scalability perspective um you've got the digital distribution but you've got the ability to move now now do you see differences in in different states in in different age groups and i mean obviously age groups i would imagine but are there things that popped out of um the conversations that you had that really surprised you um as far as well just in terms of i never thought that 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 women in south dakota would prefer this or you know just things that um came out of all of the discussions that sort of moment where you thought, you know, I never thought that, that 
that would be the case. But the more people you speak to, um, you know, whether it's a, a strange thing or an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is. It's, it's amazing. We have women in 25 countries that participate and we have women in every state in the U.S. and Canada. Um, it's it's so cool to see how they all interpret the yes. capsules differently. I mean, you know, the Pacific Northwest is a completely different style than Texas, <laughs> for instance. Yes. And it, it's fascinating for me to sit back and watch that because it is a formulas concept. And I know that they can use specific values for the formulas and really see everything come to life. As a creator, that is what is most personally satisfying for me is to see everything come to life. And also how it works for all of these different demographics and all of these different shapes and sizes. I wanted to build something really truly inclusive. I wanted to democratize personal style. Most women can't afford $150 an hour yeah. to have a stylist come into their home, shop their closet for them, and then take them out shopping for a few hours. It's just not feasible. So I knew that I wanted a product that women could afford and that would reach all of them and was not going to exclude anybody for any reason. And that was a lot easier said than done, <laughs> if yes. I'm being honest, but, you know, really just refining that through the years and, um, and the women in my community just represent it more beautifully than I ever could. Yes. They are just such a beautiful, diverse representation of everything, yes. every possible thing. And, um, I think that that speaks for itself. So your, would your biggest challenge going forward be finding more people, more Allison's as it were, um, <laughs> Um, that, that you can trust that that are not going to suggest that that people go back to yoga pants as a form of rebellion for example so is, is that a challenge or have you found that you've been able to tap into this um, rich seam of, of, uh, of talent and enthusiasm from the people that you've met uh, yeah so <laughs> if we're talking staffing um, and personnel I, you know I would love to have a second Allison but quite honestly when I think about it I'd love to have a second Lauren who is my business manager she's amazing and she balances me out in every possible way um, and you know just finding somebody that I'm an INFJ Enneagram type and she I think she's an IN, INTP I'm not absolutely positive on that but we balance each other out so well. And I think that that was really key for me finding somebody that was able to fill in my gaps. Yes. And if I could have two of her, that would be absolutely amazing. But, you know, we can all wish for those things, right? I, I think, is there an Enneagram symbol for someone who likes to live in denial and doesn't like the idea of doing an Enneagram? Because, I mean, that scares me. It's like, no, I do not want to know anything more about myself. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there's one out there. I'm an Enneagram five and we yeah we love knowing about personality typing it's like it's 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 a rabbit hole for sure i'm sure that but but again that that must be quite you know interesting with the work that you do because you know tying together what people like and matching it with some of this profiling so i i just think the um the possibilities the more data you get from people um presumably that means that your decisions and your um, recommendations can become more targeted more informed um, so that gives you more power. So that must be one of the real benefits of the sort of the, the digital um, element of what you're doing. It, it truly is, you know, and, and again, just going back to the surveys, we still do customer surveys twice a year and gathering all of that input and, you know, just not being afraid to hear honest feedback from your customers and giving them a way to, to submit that anonymously and having all of that data there to boil down and really just involving them in the program creation. I think that that's a, a huge part of the success, if I'm being honest, because I allow them to be my partners in creating this. And I ask them, what trends do you like? What trends don't you like? You know, what pieces did you love last season that you'd love to rewear again? And I take all of that, my team does, and boils it down into this list so that whenever I go into a new season, I'm able to really just tailor creating the capsule around what they really truly want and involving them in that process. And then that also makes them want to be involved in the next season that's coming out because they feel like they've had a say that they've been heard and you, your customers have to feel like you're listening to them. Do you, they do really you name need to feel collections that. or ideas after some of the people that you, that you speak to? I mean, you could, um, I, I guess you could have such a brilliant idea from someone that you could name that collection after her. Um, so people realize it's just not a, uh, you know, faceless organization that there really is that, uh, is, is that something that, I'm sure it must be one of the ideas that you... 
I, I love that idea. No, we haven't done that yet. That's that's brilliant. I love it. No, um, but I do give props when I can. And sometimes yes. in our community groups, our Facebook group that we have, I'll say, oh, yeah, I saw I saw Mary wearing this item and I just knew that I had to include it on a capsule or, you know, I was inspired by seeing Anne's version of this outfit. So I really wanted to include this or I do try to give those shout outs when it's possible to let them know that they they inspire me as much as my capsules inspire them. They inspire me more, I would say, because they take my ideas and turn them into something that I never even could have dreamed of. And I think that's the beauty of it is seeing all of that creativity rising up in the community. And as women do the program for a longer period of time, they generally start out, you know, just following the outfit formula straight off the page to the letter, no variations, no substitutions, which is fine. That's a great place to start. As they grow in the program, we see them starting to take those liberties, their own personal style starting to come out in different ways. And just really that exploration and part of that journey, it's it's like a personal development journey that yes. we're watching unfold. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. It's a bit like, you know, when you have people that create these absolutely fantastic playlists or stock lists, or, and then they become famous within the E-Trade environment for being one of the fund managers to watch or one of the, the, uh, the, the and these are all like, you know, amateur guys, but they're, um, they become, um, sort of famous within that environment so i i can i can see that i can see you know people um you nurturing and um creating the ability for more people to sort of um i don't know what i'm talking about here i'll probably cut this out in the edit i totally understand what you're saying yes Yes. absolutely yeah i I think it's really cool to watch watch that happen and and the and the influence again like that trickles down from me through the customers and out into the world organic and the community supports the community and it does basically no one ever watches youtube ever again which i think would just be fantastic Um, (laughs) apart from people who want to watch this video on on youtube which is obviously exactly yeah that's okay you can watch our channel just not the other one exactly that's right but but, um, (laughs) i would love to switch gears at this point alison i would love to introduce you to the hooked on startups quick fire questionnaire fun You're so scary fun. <laughs> I have fun and hand, scary okay perfect these are, these are very 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 difficult questions okay good question number one what is your favorite word potential question number two what is your least favorite word <laughs> can't or won't you know, you're not the first person to say that, actually. It's, it's like this yeah. common thread, which I wholly approve of. <laughs> Question three, what are you most excited about now? Ooh, I'm going to the beach in a week. And my book is launching. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first one's much more important. Yes. You can clearly see that the beach vacation has the bigger payoff for me than, you know, this book I've been working on for three years. But, no, I need I need the downtime right now, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was say, it's just good to <laughs> Question number four, what turns you off right now? Mm. Division. Question number five, what sound or noise do you love? The ocean. I see a theme here. Question number six, what sound or noise do you hate? (laughs) I've had a construction project going on on this other side of the wall for about four months now, so... (laughs) <laughs> actually, it finished two weeks ago. You're just imagining it now. Cause you oh, yeah. It. Actually, so you're, you're, probably, you're probably right about that. Question number seven, and you may plead the fifth. What is your favorite curse word? Oh, it's the F word for sure. Good. I mean, I'm... It's so much power. It is. Flexibility, yeah. power. Don't, don't trust anybody that tells you it's not the F word. I, th- I th- well, I, yeah, I, yeah, there are variations of that that, that again, have made me sit back in just pure admiration. Mm. Question number eight, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I believe actor. I used to dabble in it a bit and I would love to get back into doing some theater for sure. And question number nine, what profession would you not like to attempt? Oh, we had a guy come out and clean our septic tanks a few months ago, so I would have to say, <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, well, where well, there's muck, there's brass, as they say. Yeah, yeah, that is true. And he was telling us what an amazing business he's built. And I'm, I am just so 
I admire him for that, for sure. <laughs> it's yours. Don't worry. Yeah, yes. <laughs> funnily enough, there's not that much competition. I really don't. No, there's not. That's what he was telling us. Then. Yeah. <laughs> My final question, Alison. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the Purdy Gates? Well done on always trying to become a better version of yourself every day. That's brilliant. Alison, it's been such a pleasure having you on. My Thank final, you. final question is, how do people find out more about you, about Get Your Pretty On, about everything that, you're, that you've done and you're doing? How do they become part of your network? And, and um, what, what's, the, what's the best way to contact you? You can find me everywhere online at getyourprettyon.com. All of the social handles are Get Your Pretty On, and the Outfit Formulas program is at outfitformulas.com. Fantastic. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you once again. You are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan.